Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. On today's episode, I'll be interviewing guitar virtuoso and songwriter from the band Polyphia, Tim Henson. But before we do that, if you're new to the channel or a returning viewer, make sure you hit the subscribe button now. Here's my interview. Hey everybody, you've seen him before. Tim Henson is back again. He's got a new Polyphia record out. Tim, welcome. Thank Good to you. have you. Thank you for having me. The last time I saw you was here in Atlanta when you played and came by the studio. It was probably, how long? Just over a year ago, maybe? Yeah, yeah. About last October, it's December now, so yeah, like a pre, year, 14 months. Pre-studio being finished. I yep. just saw pictures of Tim's studio, and I love new studios. Thank you. I'm a, uh, and it's beautiful. So Tim, let's talk about this new record. Let's talk about your new guitar. I love that you have a electric classical Ibanez. Thank this is you. really amazing. So the, the inspiration came from in 2020, or 2019 or 2020, I think 2020. We were in, on tour in Europe and uh, just like messing around, like hanging out before the show. And I think we were in Cologne, Germany. And we went into a pawn shop and I saw um, this Ibanez nylon string. And it, it was like an S shaped body, like as, you know, an S body, yeah, like yeah. thin, super thin. Yeah. And it had a nylon headstock. And I just thought, like, weird, Dude, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and I picked it up. And it had all the upper fret access and, it, you know, like I plugged it in and I was like, wow, I started playing like Polyphia riffs on it. And like I had always struggled to play like any of our riffs on an acoustic type guitar before just because like, I don't know, steel string is really hard for me to play. And then, of course, like there's no upper, there's less upper fret right. access. Yeah. Um, and I was like, wow, this sounds crazy. Like the Polyphia riffs through, through a nylon esque guitar and so I bought it it was like 700 euros um and I was just like I, I need this and I took it home from Europe with me um and just started playing with it a lot and really kind of fell in love with it so I texted Ivan and it's like what is this and uh, they told me it's a commercially failed model from 1998 <laughs> And um, I thought I saw those in the late 90s or so that yeah. they had those. Yeah, 98. Um, and I guess there just really wasn't a market for it then. Yeah. Now you just create the market, right? Well, yeah. And, and it was like difficult to convince them to do that even because they had like talked about doing it before with Tosin. And I just thought to myself, like, wow, man, like, if, they, if like, Tosin didn't do it with them, they're not going to do it with me. <laughs> right. He, um, had to, he had to build his own. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. what ended up happening. Um, <laughs> exactly. And, um, and, and what was funny was that I was telling Tosin about this as these negotiations with Ibanez were going on. Wait, is this why he built his own or no? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe he was already working on it. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. But, like, I, he was like, dude. If they don't build it for you, I'll build it for you. And I was like, okay, man, I appreciate <laughs> that. And I like legitimately thought that they weren't going to do it. Um, and like I had told Ivan is like, hey, like, you know, if if y'all don't want to do this, like I get it, but like I'm gonna do it elsewhere. Um, and it doesn't like because they don't have a product like that. It right. doesn't like mess anything up. Yeah, you know. And uh, then they just came back and were like, no, 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 we'll do it. And I was like, oh, okay. And so we went through, well, basically how that happened too was just like, we created Playing God um, and the demo version of Playing God was what was used to convince them. Right. And also like I... Did you have a demo video of you doing it yes, too? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. There you go. It was the album four teaser yeah. um, that I had posted like October of that year. Yeah. Um, and... I just went and screenshotted all the comments that said, like, where can I buy this guitar? I would love a guitar like go. this. And I screenshotted every comment from every platform <laughs> that said anything <laughs> like that. And I had a whole zip folder of like 300 screenshots. And in the email, you know, just wrote like, we like wrote like a huge email and put the screenshots in there and attached the Playing God demo and said, you know, like we told Mike, like, yo, when you go to Japan, like play this for the whole room you know, and make sure there's a speaker that you, so that they could like hear the bass and stuff. Um, and so he did and he came back and he's like, yeah, they're down. And- uh, Wow, awesome. Yeah, so we were really stoked on that and uh, we started doing prototypes. And the first one uh, that they made was- When they do prototypes, if I, I don't mean to interrupt, when they do prototypes, do they do, they didn't do any of the neck, the, the 
inlays or anything like that in the prototypes, right? Or do they? Um, I didn't have the design then. Okay. Um, so yeah, they didn't. They didn't have. Now, it was on the those. width of the neck? This is. What I, I was really curious about this uh, about the the old guitar that you had bought in the in the in the shop in Europe, and how the neck width is in comparison to this one. Are they similar? The neck on that one is very much an S. Okay, I was wondering neck. about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's like way too, it's like uncomfortably thin. Right. Um, and uh, it's really odd to have a, an S neck with nylon strings. Right. Like, and so like, it's just a bit jarring in general, the yeah. experience, you know? So I can see like, why why people didn't actually buy it in the first yeah, place right you know because it, it's you're really taking two things that are so far apart from each other the super shredder guitar and like a classical guitar and right. like versus you know this is like more of a traditional body shape and more of a traditional like i mean you know more of like a well, c same, shape yeah and and the, the but the width of the neck is similar to what a, it's it's exactly what a classical guitar would be pretty mm -hmm. much yeah the sen was what it was called, wasn't like that. It was yeah. like very much like an electric guitar, so. But yeah, so the first prototype that they made uh, had like the heel shaved way down. Okay. Um, and it was like just a one piece. And it had like, I think it was just like a bit wider. Yeah. And it was a useless guitar yeah. because they had accidentally glued the bridge on in the wrong spot. Okay, that's not, that's so not good. So <laughs> it couldn't be intonated. <laughs> okay. And they couldn't just take it off and move it. Okay. So like they, you know, I'm playing the guitar and I'm like, dude, this feels awesome. Like it's so easy to play and like it's very, you know, for as thin as this guitar is, it's yeah. very resonant for, yeah, yeah. for that, you know? And, um, but I was like, dude, I can't get it to intonate. and. They took it back and they were like, "Oh, oh, we put the bridge we put in the, the right bridge, spot. yeah." <laughs> and and uh, so they gave it back to me and they're like, "Well, uh, it's it's a souvenir, I suppose." And they were like, "We're gonna make a new one." Um, and so they made the second one, and the bridge was in the correct spot. And this this guitar, uh, you can see it on my YouTube channel. It's the white bread looking guitar. Yeah, yeah. It looks like bread. Yeah. Um, because I was like, yeah, do the top white and just leave the rest of it like unfinished. And then it ended up coming out like bread. Um, and we actually ended up gifting that guitar to Steve Vai, um, which was like, you know, as kind of like a appreciation thank you for being on our record and, and just being like such a cool dude and like kind of like a, a mentor figure in a way, you know? And so we had like sent him that. And so he's got that one now, the bread guitar. Okay. So there were two prototypes, and then they were like, oh, well, that factory said they couldn't, can't, like, make it anymore. So we found a new factory, and then they sent me <laughs> this one. Okay. Um, and this, by this time, I had decided, like, you know, I'm, I want to do, like, an entire line of Tree of Death guitars. Um, and so I told them to stick the inlay on here and make it black because like people were just like really making me feel weird about the bread guitar <laughs> and all the comments, everybody said it looked like bread. Um, and I couldn't tell like it, if it was a good thing or not. Right, now, is that good or bad? Now in hindsight, people are like, oh my God, I really want the bread guitar. Oh like, my God. What, is that one going to come out? Like, um, but at the, at the time, it they it didn't feel that positive right you know what i mean yeah um but anyway so they they brought me this one and this one like played the best and i guess the heel is different but i just like got used to it and i was like okay well this one's good to go when you get up in the high register there your thumb uh just basically rests right on that and the heel's angled yeah right so just kind of like up here okay so i was wondering when i first saw you play it on the playing god playthrough um i was wondering about the string spacing compared to your electric and how you got used to to the clat this a different size thing for your right hand what's it like to play with a different string spacing with different resistance to play play things like playing that song it's I guess because there's all those different things you have you have resistance of the strings is different the string spacing is different so it changes how your right hand is mm -hmm. you know it, when you're trying to get 
if you're hybrid picking or whatever you're doing? I guess like it, you know, moving from an electric guitar to an electric nylon guitar yeah. is a lot easier to do than to move from an electric guitar to a full nylon guitar. Right. Um, so in comparison of knowing what a real nylon guitar feels like, I was like, Dude, this is like doable. And it wasn't so much of like a culture shock to my hands um, to go from an electric guitar to this uh, with the string spacing and everything just because this feels drastically different than right. than a a real nylon guitar, you know. It's much it's much more suited to the electric player. So you know, just of course, there's like an, a small difference, you know. But from electric guitar to here, the electric nylon versus electric guitar to over here, yeah, the the real nylon, it's like very small. Yeah. So just with enough time and and getting used to it, like it it was pretty easy to acclimate to. So I think um, as people start to receive theirs, they'll notice there's like a bit of a learning curve, uh -huh. um, but it's not a huge one. And like, you'll be like ready to, you know, shred away as soon as, like pretty much the first day that you get it after like 30, 40 minutes or so of playing, you know. If you were to play something like uh, sweeping a line or, or tapping or anything like that, is, is there anything that's more difficult to do on that? The, the only thing, I guess, would be like tapping, probably, yeah. just because like, as you get up here, yeah. like you really have to be very accurate yeah. to like hit those, you know? Yeah. And then, um, of course, like, unless you're plugging in and playing through distortion, like, you're going to have, you know, like, it's, you're going to hear this low note a lot more than you will these high notes. That's you know? right, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, it, I, I guess there's you'd have to adapt play style. Okay, but. so I'm wondering about recording your record. Did you do it in your studio, most of it? You know, I wish that we could have because. Okay. Uh, where did you do? Like, where, where did you do it? Did you do any of it in your studio? We did the end of Ego Death in the other studio. Okay. Um, the studio B, the one that I Twitch stream in. Yeah. Because. The main studio was being worked on, like they like had construction workers in my house like all day, every day, <laughs> and I like I just couldn't even go in there. So like I was just working out of the the Twitch room, and uh, that's the only thing that like was made because we were pretty much done with the record by the time that like the house was finished being built. Yeah. Um, and then there was just a few things here and there that needed to be like finished, like the ending of Ego Death with Steve. Um, but yeah, that that was about it. We did, we the first sessions that we did for the record were in LA at my old house in LA, and then the second one was. And that's back to, uh, almost. Is it? That's like twenty nineteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's been a while because mm -hmm. you've been back in Texas for a year and a half, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So twenty nineteen back in LA, and then the next sessions that we did were in Detroit. We did two. Then one in August and then one in December. And where'd you do those? Um, Metro Thirty Seven Studios. We kind of just been making our records there. Yeah. Like, uh, one of our engineers and producers, uh, Nick Sampson, lives works up at, there. Right? Yeah, lives yeah. up there and works yeah. out of that. But it's funny because like those, we didn't like actually go to that studio until the third session. But so in the second session, it's just me, Scott, and Nick, and an Airbnb, and this thing is haunted. Okay. Um, it's got the worst vibes imaginable. Okay, that's, and that's, they have that sounds great. What's called like elder bugs? Do you know what those are? No. Um, maybe it's worth like I don't have my phone, but uh, <laughs> they're they're like. Do they make sounds? No, but they swarm. Okay, that's, um, that doesn't sound good. And. Uh, I don't know what makes them swarm, but like I guess it was like in the summer, so okay. like around like Fourth of July. So like they're it's elder bug season, and so like if you go outside, the entirety of like your car would be covered okay. in elder bugs. And in my room, which was upstairs, and like I'm the only one upstairs, which is just terrifying to me because I'm like scared of the dark and everything. Um, <laughs> Like I wake up I don't every mean to morning. Laugh at that too. <laughs> I wake up every morning with like there's just elder bugs all over the floor, and oh my it's God. like just the most disturbing thing. Yeah, that and sounds disturbing. What's really weird is that like they had this bathroom upstairs with this um, bathtub, and 
they had this like this hand yeah like figurine on the bathtub and it had a, the the only light bulb that was in that room was red okay and so this this red bathroom <laughs> and it's just as creepy as it can get and the bugs like and i'm just thinking like dude this is like i can't it's the worst vibes ever right. you know it's like cursed it's very cursed um but we ended up writing a bunch of glitch stuff and then the next session get, got a much better airbnb but um yeah i really hated it <laughs> and so um so you channeled those vibes into the music then right yeah mm-hmm I mean, that's, that's how we ended up with songs like <laughs> ABC, and I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, then like it was time to do the drums, so we actually like brought it, you know, went to Metro 37 Studios. And the first time that we did this, we kind of did it the way that we normally do it, which is in this really big live room. And, you know, we're listening back to everything, and we're just like, dude, it's, this, is, this is not it. Um, and because we're because why what was what was not it about it just the mix um because playing god was finished at this time like, yeah playing god has been finished since like 2020. right so you knew um, what that sounded like and you wanted to kind of continue on with with you wanted to have a similar sonic yeah so like the demo is like a you know we call them beat versions because yeah. it's all it is is just beats right yeah, yeah and when we go to track the drums like we did it like how we normally do it which is in like a huge room Yep. with like overhead mics and everything um like room mics and it's just way too boomy yeah and i was just like dude why because you're what not, is getting, wrong the, you're not getting the clarity out of, yeah. out of the drums and so like i started looking at like wolfpack videos and they'll have videos where like their drummer is just like in a fucking staircase yeah and i just never understood why they did that until like it was like time to mix and I was like turning off the overhead mics. Right. And even then it was still like still too boomy. Yeah, still, still too, too much boomy. ambience. Yeah, right? way too much ambience. And yeah. I was like, dude, did they do that because they wanted like a really tight sound? Because I just I just always thought it was like really goofy that they put the drummer in you the know, staircase. Like, so my ISO booth that's right over there, I made it big enough. I, did, I have a 16 input panel in mm. it so that I could record drums for super tight drums. I use that as a vocal booth and as a drum ISO mm -hmm. booth because even out here or in the drum room down there, that drum room is really live. This this is less live. If I take the carpet up, it's way, it's it's more live, but that is super dry that ISO booth yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, dude, that's that that's like the secret sauce. Yeah, that that kind of made me realize like uh, you know, cuz at this time too, I'm also planning the build of of my house and the build of the studio and I'm like okay I want a tiny ass drum room like right. very similar to like what you have going on yeah. here with the, the vocal now you have a booth. panel on the wall then with for my, for the mic inputs and everything that, yes that yeah, are, yeah yeah so it goes so how many inputs do you have I've in got there? 24 did you put your panel these this is the one mistake that I made when I built the studio is that I put the panel in front of the door so that when there's the mics go uh you, you always end up walking on cables, which drives mm. me nuts. That was the one mistake that we made in here, that putting the mic, the mic panel on the wrong, wrong spot in the room. Yeah, I, I got lucky, and I guess we avoided that. I hired um, Gavin Haverstick, mm -hmm. who, who, like, on his website, he, he does, like, a lot of... He did, like, 21 Pilot Studio and, like, a bunch of people's, like, really nice studios. And so I think that that one he probably just already had planned out because like I never even got that far as to like what's really happening so, so in the your, studio. So, like, so your patch bay though on your in your studio now comes up to the to your comes up here then right how's it how's it work so exactly in my studio let's say the desk is there right yeah the patch bay is up just up directly right. behind the desk okay and we the room is really cool because you can walk around everything yeah like really easily um that's like the best part about it so i don't have to like crawl under the desk and like deal right. with cables and shit but yeah so the the patch bay is just like behind there and then my sidecar is like to the right and that's where all the the snakes go yeah and it's just behind so like you saw from the video that like all the cables are pretty hidden. Yes, it looks um, so clean. Yeah, it's very. That's, it looks that's great for, for your videos when you when you showed me the rehearsal thing. You know mm -hmm. the the your rehearsal video. It's, yeah, I mean it looks. 
It just looked really Thank clean. You. It looks Thank great. You. Yeah, that was like the goal with the studio was to just have a super like immaculately clean uh, space. And I like had um, a bunch of like fake foliage in my previous studio. Right. And I was like, dude, I can't wait to see what it looks like inside of this studio. And I put all the green fake foliage in there and I was like, it sucks. Right, and I was like, the whole, it ruins the whole vibe of it. Like it's the, well, because everything's black and white. Yeah, right? it's like the, the, the reason why this looks cool is because it's very minimal. There's like right. nothing in here other than the essentials, you know. Yeah. So I took it out and I sold all the trees, um, and uh, all the fake trees, and then I bought two new fake trees that are the, just the white completely ones, right? white. Yeah. yeah, yeah, those look cool. Um, and they just they just hang out like next to the speakers and that that's the only like kind of decor that's in the room i think um I, we just got the one million plaque for yeah man Bolivia. thank you congratulations um, and and i guess pretty soon in the next i don't know i think i'm sitting at like 750 or something like yeah. that pretty soon i'll get one but like i thought about putting the plaques Tim, up, you have like, to do more videos you know i know <laughs> that's that's how you're gonna get uh yeah. gonna get to that million i got I, I have to make the studio video of showing it up you, you're like one of the only people that have seen it and like, people <laughs> love studio video yeah. builds like that i just like i'm so overwhelmed by it because yeah. i have a note of all the things that i want to talk about and yeah. and it's just very overwhelming and i and i was just always just putting it off while the other studio is built and it's one more piece and it's done, so then I have nothing else to put it off with. But um, yeah, I wanted to put it above, you know, kind of like on the wall up there, but yeah. then like we kind of all made a deal in the Polyphia Boys that we're just gonna hang these up in our bathrooms. Um, so I guess like I'm just gonna keep, no the only good decor is gonna be the trees and then I can like put all the cool accomplishments in the bathroom. Well, I like the, uh, had I done this, I mean, I this was a, actual recording studio and never thought about making videos. I never would be, I never let any bands that I produced ever take a video of me mm -hmm. or even take a picture of me. If I were to build a studio again, you know, I didn't have any of these aesthetic things. And when you were t t telling me about building your studio when you were here mm -hmm. uh, and you had just kind of, well, your house was being built back yeah. then and everything, but uh, you're thinking about the thing where it's like, okay, well, you have your Twitch room and then you have the studio and you're, you're always thinking about video. That's kind of a thing with, with modern, if you're in a band today that we never thought about, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, how are we gonna, how's it gonna look on film, our rehearsal space or a recording studio or anything like that? Yeah, it really, you know, I've been in every kind of rehearsal space imaginable, um, you know, because when you're a teenager and, and like everybody's chipping in um, you know, fifty dollars every month for the practice space. Yeah. Um, and like, it's like, dude, I don't have enough money to to, to pay for the practice space this month. <laughs> and one of the other band members has to like, you know, cover it, and right. everyone's real Always. mad at you. Like, yeah. Um, but that's like, never changed. You know, it's it's a U-Haul storage space. Yeah. Like, there's no air conditioning. Um, it's very hot in Texas. It's very cold oh in Texas. God. Oh yeah. Um, so we're like practicing out of a U-Haul thing. Uh, we've also done a Be cockroach there, infested uh, rehearsal spaces. Oh yeah. Looks really bad. Like the, I think it was like an old office building from like the the eighties or nineties. So it's got like the terrible, terrible, you know, carpet that you see like in the show like The Office, you know yeah. what I mean? Like remember when they ripped up the carpet and they're like, why would they do this? There's beautiful hardwood floors under here. Like, right. and the carpet is just hideous. And then they've got like the, the ceiling. The, the drop ceiling. The, you can like punch the tile up. Yeah, the panels, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all of that. They're like missing and like, you know, you just don't know what's up in the abyss there and like. Nothing it, good. Yeah, it's just, Nothing you know, good. we've done it all. So, and, and how we got around that was we would, and you can see these like places in our old videos. Yeah. Um, we just moved everything from one side of the room to the other, so it's just nothing. Right. And just put it in like black and white, so you couldn't see like any of the details, and just did as much as we could to like get it clean looking. And I guess you know we kind of like came up on YouTube. Uh, you so, did. You're like a YouTube band. I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. We, so we had started there, and, and we gradually had made the transition from YouTube to you know concerts. Yeah. Um, and like touring all over the world and stuff. But like, 
during that time, I guess, yeah, like we were very focused on like, how is this going to look on camera? Which is, um, a, which is amazing. I mean, this is, you're actually a great band. When people ask me about how do they should promote their records, and how they should promote their, their music, and I'll use you guys in, as an example. <laughs> because cool. it's, it's really, it's almost impossible to tell people because, you know, I mean, what is a record deal anymore? Like, the most important thing you can do is get social media exposure mm -hmm. for free. Yeah. Right. And, and how do you do that? Is you have to build a following, and it takes a long time to do that. In the very day. much so. Yeah. And it takes a dedication of, of actually making the videos and stuff. But like you guys are really a great example of using social media to to develop your I, I your think, platform. You know, it's just like in every era, there's always going to be changes. Yeah. You know, and it's there's going to be the people that can figure out those changes as they happen. And I guess currently we're in the TikTok era. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, how, you know, because every label is like, they just try and push you to make TikToks so right. that like your song possibly pops and then like you get radio play and streams and whatever else. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how much of that is going to translate to like hard ticket sales and things like that. Um, well, to me, the, a platform like TikTok, because it's, I don't think that people go to bands' websites watching a TikTok, TikTok video like they do if you're on YouTube, mm -hmm. since YouTube's more of a long form yeah, content yeah. platform. And TikTok is very just consume yeah. it like and in they, 15 they seconds it, and then watch it and, and they're the on to the next one, one on the next yeah. one. One of my buddies that works for a major label, he said that. TikTok changed their algorithm. He worked for a major. He's, mm -hmm. he's head of A and R at a, a major, major label, and um, he said that they changed their algorithm back in July. That wasn't favoring music as much. That there's a lot of talking mm. videos on TikTok that are getting big. That they're pushing right, and that the labels that were relying on getting their promotion from TikTok. We're, it wasn't reliable anymore to yeah. have the viral videos. Do you know anything about the, this or no? Uh, I don't, but that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. You know, like it's it's moving quicker than ever. Right. And it's like, how can you adapt? How can you change? Is, is the art that you're making, you know, going to stand the test of time through each platform? You right. Because there's, right. like, there's people that like made vines. And how Absolutely. how long was vine around for? You know what I mean? Not and, long. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's really weird because you see like incredible artists like Steve Lacey go play his concerts and everybody really only knows like the 15, 15 seconds, seconds of the right. thing and yeah. then just do them really dirty on the rest of the song. And it's just like, whoa, like it's very odd. And, yeah. um, and it, it's, it gets even weirder too with, I guess on the subject of things changing really rapidly with like me and Scott were talking about this yesterday, but like AI. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure that here in the next few months or the uh, next year, next few months, we're going to have like riff generators that can generate polyphia type riffs. <laughs> and like, you know, it's like everybody's like curious as to like whether or not they're out of a job. Like I see like copywriters no longer have a job, like because they, the AI can just generate copy. Yeah, I, and, and I, I was just talking about it the other day. So me and Scott were with this artist, uh, Break-Ins, the other day. And, and this kid is insane. Um, I'll have to show you. It, it's very cool musical stuff. But we were talking about how in like the 80s, 70s and 80s, when like hip hop kind of started and yep. like people were sampling records. And like I could imagine a, a vast majority of like music people were like, as it was a new form of creation and expression, yeah, kind of. Well, you can't do that. That's somebody oh, else's I remember music. That. I remember people saying that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. now it's like, well, how creative can you sample? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, pretty soon it's going to be how creative can you use the AI? Right. Like, <laughs> and uh, like it's going to be the the next big artists that are going to be who can prompt the best. <laughs> um, and it's going to be a really weird thing to see. But of course, you know, like obviously. They're, you know, the AI can never, well, who knows, actually. We'll go but, play live. You, like, but the emotion right. that, that a human can channel into artwork, right? Because you look at a lot of the AI art, and it's very, you can tell that it's AI art. Yeah. It's very soulless, very just like.
it, it almost looks like stock images. So I looked at pictures of me, these AI pictures. Some of them look like, like they're, uh, some look like actual pictures. They look like pictures, but you can tell they're not really pictures. And then some are kind of look like art, you know, that they're paintings yeah. or something, mm -hmm. right? And um, I'm looking at it, it's like, and some of them will have have a beard on me. It's like, that's not what my beard looks like. <laughs> yeah, they're just, it's just like assuming. Dude, it's weird too, because you look at like face app and whatever those things are, like, you, you, you can make yourself have smiles and it's like, bro, that's not my teeth. Like, right. <laughs> um, and it's just really creepy because, you know, you're just adding a smile to a photo that you didn't have a smile and it's just like, it's just really weird. Okay, so when but, you were doing, I'm gonna totally yeah. change the topic here. Yeah. When you were doing your, your Playing God uh, playthrough video, YouTube video, uh, you were doing the track breakdown and then you played your Omnisphere patch with the arpeggiator, yeah. mm -hmm. okay? And then you, showed what that was and you said this is really hard to learn and but you did yeah. i mean it was really can you play some of those riffs like that and what kind of what is that stuff that you would never come up with unless you were trying to do this or, or what i mean they're they're very unnatural patterns right um because you know if you can, were going can you to de can you demonstrate a couple right, of so Tell me about the things that are unnatural to play on that. So you've got this. Just Tim, this is why it's it freaks me out when I watch your playing <laughs> when you do the because you have so many different things going on here. You have a sweep into a hybrid pick into a hammer on from nowhere. Yes. So it's, there's it does there's, all the techniques. It does all the yeah. techniques really fast. Yeah. And and one after another. Just do that yeah. slowly. So though, we've got. There's the sweep, sweep, sweep to the hybrid. Sweep to hybrid. Then... Now, Tim, that is so, but but you have an upstroke, you're doing an upstroke on the low E string mm -hmm. though, right? Yeah. That is really, then you're immediately back down, I think on the D or something like that in that lick. So it's really, do you yeah. even think about it? If you think about it, does it screw you up? Yeah, I can't. The, yeah. the idea is that, you know, like, you, you practice it enough to where to you don't to have think to about think it. about it. Yeah. And then like, if I can play it with my eyes closed on stage while like engaging with the crowd, yeah. then that's the way that it needs to be. Cause if I think about it, it, I will mess it up. Yeah. But, um, and then you'll put taps in too. So then you'll have like, you know, yeah. And then like the harmonics and it's, it's the pattern is just weird because versus like, and then it goes, so the the notes are just yeah, but you're just like switching like the the way that the arpeggiator works is that I think it just randomizes like yeah. in which order yeah. they come in, and so when you memorize the arpeggiator yeah, it's like very unnatural um, yeah. and so uh, that's what makes it, it sound so cool though. yeah, and it gives it a, a very interesting timbre to it I suppose when you did the um. And people, you guys should watch Tim's video breakdown of the song. Well, oh, I'll, I'll play it in a second. I'll play the song. But um, you also show where you do the, uh, you take a, a section of your guitar and put it up the octave, like a doubling. Yeah. And when you do the pitch change in an Ableton, mm -hmm. yeah, you're doing an Ableton. So you use a certain setting. What is the setting that you use? Uh, do you use a setting? Oh, I change it from the warp mode. Yeah, from beats to complex pro. And okay, then I turn the formant all the way down. Okay, and you do that because so you don't get artifacts. Or, I do get artifacts. So you do get artifacts. I'm that's why you for do the it. Artifacts. You want, yeah. That's what I was wondering about. Yeah, because it gives it a really interesting. Like, that's what makes it sound like, so so the like doubling of it sounds or something. Yeah, you know what I mean, like especially when you put it up the octave, it gives it the chipmunk crystals effect. And yeah, then, like what I like to do is I have the actual you know in the in the center. Yeah, and then I'll double it, and th this is how I get away with like not having to double track a lot because <laughs> I'm lazy. Uh, I'll just double it and then throw it up the octave, do the pitch thing yeah. with the artifacts, and then spread it. 
so that like you'll spread that track yeah, wide right so that in one's like more ambient yeah you know what i mean and it becomes like more of an, an effect and then you can put just like a tad delay or tad reverb on that one so that yeah. you've got like the the punchiness of the main one that's in the center that's yeah, down in, in the, the regular center. octave yeah, yeah. Like and then you, you have the octave like, up mm -hmm, where you would hear like vocals or, or the bass or something you know yeah. what i mean and then the octave up kind of acts like atmosphere and or backing vocals yeah um this and is kind of like playing the AI. So this is really interesting. So when you're creating stuff, this is really kind of one generation before the AI, right? Yeah. But this is actually using these plugins. And Omnisphere is one of the best plugins. Yeah, it's that, a great that, one. In terms of the generation before AI, where you're kind of using anything to your advantage. And like I said, I guess it's like who can, eventually it's going to be who can prompt the best. Yeah. Um, but you know, like producers now, like just get really creative with how they use these uh, plugins to create, not just like mix. This is where people you know? get mad at me on my on my when I do like the top ten Spotify countdowns of the pop charts, mm -hmm. and when I say nice things about the songs because I'm a producer first, and yeah. I and I know how hard it is to create really good. Yeah sound design stuff mm -hmm. like that you know production things yeah. it takes a lot of trial and error to do these things and come up with original original sounds yeah it's it's also really odd too that a lot of uh a lot of what you're hearing on like the top 10 will have just like splice samples yeah it's like the main loop. yeah the drum the drum loops will be yeah even the main loop you know what I mean? yeah the main melodic thing will just yeah. be a splice sample and you know, I guess it's good for producers who, who put their things on Splice because it's it's a nice bag, like, without having to get a placement. But then you, the one placement happens that pops and you don't get that bag. You know, it's like right. you're trading one bag for the other, a That's guaranteed right. smaller bag or like a risky, <laughs> you know, right. huge bag. But um, people that don't do this is interesting. So people that don't do um, music production. Splice is a platform, a, a sample platform that's been around for, oh God, probably 10 years maybe. I don't even know. No, probably. maybe not that long. Maybe it's, that long. Maybe like 2013, 2014. Yeah. I guess it's 2023 right now. Yeah, 2022. Almost, 20, <laughs> almost 2023. But it's yeah. been around and it's for, they, they yeah, it has samples, one shot samples, loops, all these different things. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a subscription thing and people use this for production. It used to be that when I first started, that people around Atlanta back in 2000 would have their, you know, MPCs machines, and they would play the beats and things like that, and program yeah. them and stuff. And then it went to people would get mad about that. I think, you know, with right? Drum with using a drum machine, <laughs> right? But then, uh, then people started you. I mean, eventually people would went to to Ableton and things like that for, yeah. for beat creation. And then, uh, but Splice is another thing that 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 it is used and it's really really common. I wonder if you could download a sample from Splice and just one, like one melodic sample and you know duplicate it so that it's 2 minutes long and then upload it to Spotify. <laughs> like sure I, you can. I wonder if that's a thing and That's like, my next video. You could do some a different artist could do the same thing with one less or one more loop. Right. so that it's like two minutes and two seconds right and it's a different song i wonder if there's any like it only needs to be 30 <laughs> seconds for it to count as a to get a play oh for real yeah so that's all you had to, yeah just make yeah. 30 seconds yeah songs. 30 seconds and then 32 that's seconds like, that's like a, a double a, uh you figure you get like four tick tocks out of that yeah <laughs> it's uh it's an interesting time that we're living in and i think it's we're going to see a lot of things happen that <laughs> that are I don't know, and people are gonna look back on this video and be like, what is grandpa's talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but you can't, the one thing that they can't AI yet is live performance. And that's ultimately what, yeah. you know, when people come to see you play, they're coming to see the live, you know, to see you in person, mm -hmm. watch your fingers, whatever, watch what you guys are playing, listen, yeah. and get the live experience. And you can't, you can't have AI do that. Yeah. At least yet. Well. You know, what's what's really interesting about that is, okay, so you know how you've seen the Playing God video? Yeah. Um, the original concept for the Playing God video was based off of, you've seen iRobot? Yeah. 
when Will Smith gets mad and he slams his shit on the table or whatever, and he's like, can a robot paint a masterpiece? <laughs> can a robot make a symphony? <laughs> you know what yes. I mean? Um, so that was like the, the, the concept behind this video that we wanted to do where what we were going to do was we were going to film ourselves playing the parts up close yeah so that like maybe with like hand tracking gloves yeah um and then we were going to have somebody render like robots with oh right you know that the, so you can see your fingers there. the fingers yeah yeah but then we were going to like place them in a room and somebody would just film this empty room on an iPhone. Right. Like real, like like you're in person. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it would replace, be like you're at a concert or something with robots playing. Or right? yeah, just like or just like a weird like room that you stumbled into and the robots like turn alive and start playing shit. Yeah. But um yeah, and and that was like the thing was can a robot like compose a symphony <laughs> and then like play it? And that was like the whole idea but it, it didn't come to fruition but it would have been cool so you have chino on your mm -hmm. record from deftones how do you know him i think our old manager might have went to high school with him okay. or something um they're both from sacramento I, yeah i believe and i'm a massive deftones fan and uh they, and they're was, amazing yeah and and i was i was thinking like i looked it up earlier i was thinking those guys are younger than me I think Chino's 49 or so, mm -hmm. and uh, but I just, and I, I was saying to Billy earlier that I said a great Polyphia singer is Chino. That would be, yeah. like, to, to have somebody that's, I mean, he sounds amazing. You can uh, hear it. Yeah. <laughs> it exists. It's like, <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah. I'm going to play, let me, let me play that track here. I love how you go from halftime there, you, it changes yeah, there. to like the dance beat. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really amazing, but I love his voice with you guys. I think it's incredible. He's he's so, he sounds so good. He, yeah. He's like a legend. Um, the funny thing about that song is that the original demo that he had tracked to, we, well, Scott just scrapped it mm -hmm. and then wrote around like just wrote a new thing entirely around uh around his vocal? vocals yeah that's awesome and um man he was so cool in the studio like it, and what's really funny too is that we did the vocals for abc and the vocals for bloodbath in the same studio back-to-back -back sessions um, and where was it where did you do that was, i can't remember the name of the studio but it's in, in, in hollywood somewhere okay um and uh it was just such a weird like change. right right because it, the, because the songs are so different oh right? yeah they're like the two most dr right uh, okay let me play abc <laughs> so people someone call it paramedic i can't speak it's all phonetic made me forget every word cause like that's a lot of letters a b c d e f g h i j k l m n o p q r s t u v w x y 911 hello it's me sophia yes this is an emergency yes 
the way they put it down on me. Got the whole room tips. Hyperventilating when we be procreating. Did you learn to do that thing? How you hold the bat when you swing? I don't think I can breathe. I don't think I can be. I don't think I can think. I don't think I can see. Fuck. Someone call a paramedic. I can't speak. It's all phonetic. Made me forget every word. Cause life has a lot of letters. <laughs> Pick out and put it in my locket So I could kiss you whenever I wanted I've been waiting when we be procreating Where'd you learn to do that thing? Now you hold it back when you swing did she come in and do her vocal first and then Chino came in or was it the opposite? Um, I mean, these songs are, are couldn't be any different. So any more different. Sophia's was already written. Yeah. Because um, we had like made it in another studio like months before. We yeah. were just coming to retrack it. Okay. Um, so Chino first. Yeah. Um, and that was a writing session. Yeah. And, and the cool thing was, is it was a writing session and the recording session and we were done in three hours. Um, it just, it was just like that. Like, I remember we had time between the next session uh, to just hang. I yeah. love all the bass breaks in that tune because it makes it so heavy. This is a thing that, that a lot of bands don't think about, that if you leave space in the bass, mm -hmm. in, in the bass parts, it drops out and comes back in. It just has so much more, more impact. impact. Yeah. 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 Is this stuff that you guys talk about too or no? Absolutely. I mean, like, because, you know, you... All the songs start as beat versions. Yeah. And it's the most easy to visualize when you're thinking of it in the context of like trap, EDM, and like things with big drops. Yeah. Um, and especially like when you listen to that kind of music on subs. Yeah. Um, you, then it makes a bi an even bigger impact. Yeah, it's more of a feeling yeah. than even a sound, you know. But it, um, but with when, when you have the heavy guitars, mm -hmm. God, When you have the chugging and then mm -hmm. you have the bass breaks there, it just makes it so much heavier sounding. Especially yeah. when the bass, the couple times when the bass drop, when the pitch drops on it and everything yeah. that. So it starts out with the 808 going, bam, 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 bam. You know what I mean? And so with the chugging, keeping the like the eighth note thing yeah. going, it's just like a, a really great driving rhythm. And like those accents on the, the low, heavy notes just make it that much more intense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the cool thing about that song and, and Chimera before it. It's like hybrids of like modern, I suppose like gent and metal yeah um with like modern trap production um but like really you know utilizing the space in the mix to kind of emphasize that where those guitars guitars and vocals often share the same like frequency ranges you know yeah. but the the bass and the drums like i guess the bass and the kick like all just like stay center you know um, so you're, you're playing eight string on yeah on that, that right? eight string yeah. yeah and so like you kind of have to like EQ a lot of the low end out of the yeah. the eight string guitars right. to like make room for um, like because what we do too where do you is, where do you high pass those typically when you're when you're mixing these things I couldn't give you a specific specific frequency okay <laughs> um, it's very much just like moving the thing until it sounds good yeah um, but. Yeah, I mean, we also layer the bass with it, the 808. And so what we do there is we cut off the high, anything of the high end from yep. the 808, and then cut off all the low from the bass. So the only thing you get is the clank and yeah. the note value, right? Yeah. You combine those two and kind of like blend them together a bit. Um, and like you can use like compressors and whatever, like to glue them together. Yeah. Um, and you get this really nasty hybrid of a of the, bass guitar of the bass guitar and an bass tone and then the then the low tone yeah. of the 808 that the, gives it the, the power. The cool thing is when you listen and this was like a big thing for the mix of this record was the idea was, you know, if you're let's say like you, your friend gets a new car and he's got like a great <laughs> sound system in it and he like puts a sub in the car yeah. and like he starts like bumping like rap music and you stand out of the car, outside of the guitar, uh, of the guitar, yeah. of the car. And, uh, <laughs> it's easy for you to say. I've got guitar on my mind, dude. 
um, and it's bumping and you can like clearly hear like what's happening because there's really not a lot happening in rap music other than like the 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 main three elements are the drums, the melodic parts, and the vocals, right? Yeah. So drums and bass, melodic parts and vocals, and like yeah. they all have their place in the mix. So you can really, really hear those things. Um, versus if you were to play like a metal band on the on the sub, <laughs> right? Like the double bass would go, and uh, like the, I swear they just don't really put a lot of bass in metal records. You know that kind I mean? of goes back to Metallica, man. They didn't. Uh, they, uh, you know, you get a couple of the Metallica records are very, very uh, lacking in the low end. But yeah. that's a, a lot of metal. Stylistically, it stylistically, works. yeah, yeah. And it's like, I, you know, it's awesome. It sounds great. Yeah. Um, but to to kind of try and make a hybrid of the two, yeah, was the goal. And the you know, the idea was if if you play this record in the car and stand outside of it, like, would it bump, or would it sound like noise? You know what I mean? And that was like the whole thing of why we, the the kick, all the kicks are replaced with an electronic kick. Yeah. And then, like I said, the low that you're hearing is an 808. And then you're only hearing the, the top end of that. Uh, when you replace the kick, so you replace the kick with an electronic kick, right? Mm -hmm. And then you'll have the bass and the 808 thing together. But you're, you're shaping the low end so that that, that bass sound with the 808 kind of occupies the low, low end. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times your kick will not hit at the same, or the kick will hit at the same time, but the kick will be alone in a lot of spots too. Yeah. So, it's, so it's like the, uh, that's, kind of, that's the trick with this is that you just don't have low end going on all the time and then it just becomes right. mud. Yeah. And sometimes we'll put like the 808 and the bass going without the kick. Yeah. Um, and it's, what's really funny too is if you listen to, to hip hop, you'll hear like, the bass come in and you think that like the kick is on that because there's probably just a kick blended in on the 808 sample, you know what right. I mean? Yeah. Um, and then the kick comes in and right. it's like, and like oh, yeah. oh, that's the kick. <laughs> yeah, and it is a really cool surprise. I always love that um, when when like you can't really tell if the kick's there, but then the kick just slams in. It's really cool. But And then one thing too that we really like to do, um, which like I remember, uh, I was in the studio with Luke Holland, and he was like, oh, we never do that. And I was like, no, we absolutely do that. It's putting the kick on the snare. Okay. And uh, like that happens off, if you listen to Future, a lot of his beats, like, will his snare will come slamming down with a kick. Putting the kick on the snare, like, is one of the hardest things you can do. And like, I, I guess it's frowned upon in the drummer community because when I told Luke, I was like, yo, we're putting the kick on the snare, dude. Um, I, I make Clay put the kick on the snare <laughs> often and it just, it's so cool, you know? And I guess it's like a kind of a weird thing to like Well, it, depends, do, on, it depends on what, what type of a beat it is and everything, but yeah. Typically though, you wouldn't have the kick and the snare playing together, but that's, I mean, but there's t tons of beats that do that, yeah. but, but, uh, but it's, it's... It always works out really cool when you do like a fake out drop, when the, you would think that like it's gonna slam on the one, right? Yeah. But then you make it slam on the two where the, the two, snare yeah. goes. I love that. Um, and it's just like all of a sudden, it's just like way, like it's it tricks you and it's satisfying. Um, so we do a lot of that, but. I was curious about this. When you're going through your mixing process, what do you typically get and where do you listen? Like how do you guys, do you guys listen as a band or does everybody listen at their house and make notes? House and make notes um, because there's, and do you, we listen in your car? I mean, do you, or? car test is a must. We do the AirPods test. Yeah. Um, and then. Do you do, you do a phone test laptop, ever? Yeah, phone test, laptop test, and like proper speakers test. Okay, so what do you look for in the phone test versus? Clarity. Phone test, you're, you're, you're looking for clarity and, and uh, you know, it's, I guess it's uh, two speakers, right? They changed it. Well, the, with the iPhone, yeah, it's got two speakers. You have to. To he actually hear it in stereo, you put it in landscape like this. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't know this and everything, but the iPhone it now is really sounds pretty good. Yeah, I mean, and you can deep. actually hear that. You can actually hear that it's in stereo. Yeah, I mean, and it's like a, a lot better than it was. So, used to doing a phone test was just like the bare minimum, but now the phone test is like, can I hear 
Can I even hear the bass? When I was still mixing records, this is going back now about six years ago or so, I would open up GarageBand or Logic on my laptop and I'd take an aux out of my, in there in the control room and I'd plug it in eighth inch. And I would listen to see if I could hear the bass. And mm. the bass would be on an old Mac laptop. You'd have to be about 300 hertz to hear the bass yeah. and everything. And if I got the bass to sound good on there, I would check the low end with my sub and through the mo studio monitors. And if mm. I could actually hear the bass notes, yes. uh, that would always be around 300 hertz or something like mm. that. And, and I always wanted to make sure that you could hear that as well because yeah. of people listening. And now, pe this is really before people listened on their phones. And now people listen to their phones all the time. Yeah, it's really, it's like upsetting. But you know, right? that's like a medium that people yeah. use. So like, you just gotta get used to it. But. I noticed too that vocals, because I would, that's where you could tell snare level on the phone and uh, mm -hmm. and the vocal vocal level was more apparent on smaller speakers. Yeah. So so that was really a must to do that. But you guys, okay, so you guys will will you do notes then where everybody puts their notes together? Yeah, mostly me and Scott. Um, and then like as me and Scott get to a point that we're pretty happy with it, we send it to the Clays and they. To the they, they either approve it or they have notes. Most of the time they don't. Yeah. Um, or like if they do it something specific, like, hey, can you like make this uh, drum fill like more present or something, you know? But um, yeah, we also do like the, the quiet test, mm -hmm. you know, where like if it, it's got to sound good quiet. Yeah. He's not, he, he's, he can't be blaring at no, all. No, it's got to have energy quiet too. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the thing. That's the hardest thing. I would, it used to bug me when bands would send me mixed notes and you get four separate emails from four different people and be like, just. Get together on it, consolidate yeah. to one, you know, to we, one email. We, we definitely do that. We we make it very easy for our mix engineers. Um, on this record, Zach Servini mixed it. Uh, dude's a goat. But um, we, you know, even down to like bouncing the stems. You know, like I, yeah. I group them in folders of like guitars, bass, extra instruments, like 808 electronic drums, live drums, um, and like everything starts at the same spot, and it's pre-mixed. Um, it comes in leveled, like we level it ourselves because, you know, telling somebody to like turn this part up and turn this part down is just such a waste of time, you know? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, at that point, it's more of like the sound design of the mix that yeah. like we're not able to like do ourselves, you know? Because like leveling is easy, you yeah. know? You know what needs to be turned up, you know what needs to be turned down. Yeah. Um, and, we, we often compose with the mix in mind, um, like very similarly. Like I, I learned this concept from listening to Skrillex for the first time, or like thinking back on how it was when I first listened to Skrillex. I remember thinking, this is the most wild shit I've ever heard, mm -hmm. and I didn't know that you could make music like that. Um, and, you know, if you listen to his music, like it's very, like each thing is sound designed to right. fit together, you know That's what I mean? Right. It's like a puzzle piece. Yeah. Um, and this is actually what I was talking about, about pop music, really well done. Anything that's done modern mm -hmm. music that has sound design elements, everything sounds good on its own and it's a puzzle piece. That's yes. that's the real art of yeah. of creating these things. Mm -hmm. And, and <clears throat> you, to compose with that in mind means like choosing the right sounds and shaping those sounds and leaving space like what you were saying about the bass yeah leaving I mean? space eq wise leaving space and i mean right down to the panning if something's in stereo mm -hmm. just like what you're talking about when you're talking about having a uh, you know the guitar in the center and then the the, the octave up guitar mm -hmm. spread out maybe with some more verb on it or whatever it is or delay mm -hmm. and just making those choices so that it, that when it goes to the mixer a lot of that stuff's already been decided mm -hmm. right yeah, 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 like, uh, like pretty much everything. All the I mean, that's part of the composition. Yeah, yeah. The, all the effects and everything is Are like comp yeah, composition. Yeah. Um, but yeah, even like compositionally with the bass, like leaving space between one hit and the other to like yeah. make more of an impact. Um, and uh, yeah, just like the the whole process is very intricate and hands on, and. You know, everything is very, very, very intentional. Not, not a single second. It's. I think a, the term that was described to me was called writing the mix. Mm -hmm. Like, 
like like how you'd ride a horse. Yeah, yeah. Like riding the mix so that like as each each bar happens, each bar is thought about. And yeah. Like it gets its own attention, and yeah. you have to do that the entire song, um, which makes for a really special listen because things are evolving and changing. Um, this was the first record that I, I personally got into, like sound design, where songs like Neurotica were mixing guitars. There's parts that, like, okay, I did a pass, and then Scott did a pass, and then we took like each like a bar from me and a bar from scott and a bar from me and two bars from scott two bars from me and like that's the line <laughs> and we run it through the plug-in right right and like it sounds like one person's playing it but there's just switching between tim and scott style right right um and uh so we've got a, a hybrid of between me and scott on one line and then we do the same line by chopping up vocal samples so that it fits the melody. Okay. And then we line them up and we shape them to each other. And we, I call this mirroring. Mm -hmm. um, and where you just like make sure the tail ends are like perfectly in sync. You make sure that like, so that you've got this really interesting blend of a vocal and a guitar. Then you go get a synth and add a third layer. And so you kind of like automate each thing so that like it it evolves it like does like a I don't know what I'm trying to say yeah. <laughs> it goes like that um, and it's really interesting to listen to it's constantly changing as it's progressing through the song um, and then it comes back to something familiar um, which is like the actual guitar tone you yeah know? but like as you listen to like that song in particular you'll notice that like you think you're listening to guitar and then it's just you all of a sudden it ends on the vocal and then comes back in on the guitar and you're like, when did that change? You know, and um, yeah, just like lots of little things like that. I know I, I learned something new, Tim, too, from from uh, from one of your videos that you can go on Fiverr yeah. and get somebody to do a whistle sample, a whistle melody. You can actually pay someone to do that. Now, how many whistle examples did you get from that? I only needed the one because I tuned it right. um, and, you know, mixed it. Like I, my, my, but Tim, no one in the band can whistle. Can whistle I didn't that. want to wait. Um, also, okay. like, I, I'm kind of an asshole that I like to, like, surprise people with things. Right. <laughs> um, or I'll, like, like, the end of Playing God. By the time that we had sent Ibanez the Playing God demo, yeah. it was only the first half. Yeah. There was no second half. Okay. Um, and, like, the end of Playing God from the main melody the the whistle melody to the very end of yeah. all the crazy arpeggios and the crazy riffs and stuff was done in a single night um i just like got really high and was like i have ideas and just carried them out um and you know i was like okay but i need a whistle and my my philosophy is like like why use a plug-in when you right. could like have a real person do Absolutely. it so strings trumpets like anything and it costs you what, like, like 38 bucks or something like that well you know let me just say <laughs> uh if you're gonna use fiverr buy the commercial license okay lesson learned <laughs> um <laughs> wait a minute i'm gonna play that let me play that song So yeah, the whistle and all the vocals, all the strings, like all real, all recorded by people. Um, so yeah, like I just, 
I can't whistle. I didn't know if anybody else in the band could, but like I said, I like to surprise people. I tried to do that um, whist- whistle, and I couldn't. I can't. I used to be able to whistle, but I can't get mm-hmm. the high notes anymore. As yeah. you get old, it's like you can't. I just can't. Yeah, can't get I can't, any notes I can't do all whistle. At least. That's that's the best I got. But okay, so Tim, let's talk about this the, the guitar part a little bit on this. Um, as far as there, I mean, it's a lot of jazz. This is really kind of a jazz mm. jazz chord progression. Yeah, shout out Wes Hauk. I mean, right? It's <laughs> yeah. it's like you got half to you got minor two fives and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And let's talk about the uh, about the chord progression. So yeah, it's always cool because you just move it one fret up. Right. Yeah. It's like very long mm-hmm. and not it's not eight bars. I think it's like twelve. It's twelve bars, yeah. yeah. It's 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 like a it's like a blues and that is twelve bars. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I didn't know that blues. I mean, I I guess I did know that because I know the phrase twelve bars. Yeah, but I didn't. Well, this is like a minor. Um, it's like more like a minor blues. Mm-hmm. It's a blues. It would be like a blues in E minor. I love how you're expanding the guitar, it, with all these different techniques blended together. I think it's really Thank great, you. and that's what Thank is you. really so so kind of special about what you do and what you guys do as a band is, is really pushing the envelope. Thank you. I think uh, I've, we've gotten to stand on the shoulders of giants and, you know, really like kind of get all the fundamentals of guitar playing from watching, you know, uh, older generations of like the virtuoso players like Steve and Satch, you know? Yeah. And then watching newer uh, virtuosos like Guthrie yeah, um, Guthrie would just pull out every trick in the book, right? Every one. And then you know to <laughs> to personally get to learn from Tosin. Yeah, um, like his things. And I know. Then, uh, like I just had a uh, Marson. The I don't know if you know Marson. He's uh, like a new kid on YouTube and TikTok, but oh, he's yeah, an I've insane seen flamenco yeah, yeah. player. He's yeah. showing me flamenco. Yep. Um, and so like I'm just trying to like expand the bag of tricks. You know what I mean? Right. Because it it really makes for when when you when you do all of those and and the more I do it, the more tasteful I can get with it, mm-hmm. you know. And obviously, just like anything, it takes practice um, and experience, right? And so, like, I look forward to the day down the road when I've got this, you know, really big bag of tricks and I know exactly when to use them, you know. And so, it's just a journey and. It's exciting. I really appreciate you uh, coming in today, Tim, and it's it's always good to uh, have you stop by. Thank you for having me. It's great being here. So um, check out Tim on his YouTube channel because he's got to get to a million subscribers. Road to a million, baby. I'm, and I'm, so, I'm gonna make a video. I promise. So he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna get his plaque, and Tim's gonna upload more. He promises to upload more now. At least one. <laughs> one. There's gonna be at least one more video. <laughs> All right, Tim. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right.